The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 5314 in the name of Pauline McNeill on food banks, Scotland's hunger crisis. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Pauline McNeill to open the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Ms McNeill. Thank you to all those who signed my motion on hunger, and I'm pleased to learn that the subject is of as much concern to other members as it is to me. The number of people experiencing hunger in Scotland is reaching crisis levels. Last year, the largest operator of food banks in Scotland, the Trussell Trust, provided over 145,000 three-day emergency food supplies to people. This was a 9% increase on the previous year. In 2011, there was one Trussell Trust food bank in Scotland. Today, there are 52, including one recently opened in Shetland, the least deprived local authority in Scotland. These numbers are even more shocking when you consider that there are other charities and churches who are also operating food banks. In 2017, they are almost a feature of the welfare landscape, except that they are run and funded not by the state, but by the wonderful work of charities such as the Trussell Trust, Glasgow City Mission, the Simon Community, and too many to mention. Nobody I know wants food banks to remain in permanent service, but for now, Sadly, they are a necessity and one that has saved lives. The fact that they exist is a damning indictment on the times we live, where austerity comes with very real consequences for people. Food banks are part and parcel of a response of a civilised society to the increasing number of people who live in food poverty and who have become poorer because the 2008 banking crash caused a recession which provided justification for government policy, which penalised ordinary people who had nothing to do with those seismic global events. People going hungry is not just an issue for the third world, but it is a heartbreaking fact in today's Scotland. Without food banks, people would certainly starve. I want to address at least three myths about food banks that people use them because they are there and they want free food, rather than because they have no other choice. That you can just walk in and get food. Of course you can't, a referral is needed. And that it is only people characterised as skivers who use food banks. It is not. Lord Freud, a Tory millionaire, told the House of Lords in 2013 that there is no evidence that the growth in food banks is linked to growing poverty and hunger, and merely that people wish to get free food. The facts do not support this ignorant view. Because the three top reasons for referrals to food banks, according to research carried out by Oxford University, are low income, that's people in work, benefit delays, and benefit changes. Food banks which operate in areas where universal credit has ruled out have, been, have seen a 17% rise in the need for emergency food. This is because the transition to universal credit involves a six week wait for people and often it reduces the amount of money a person receives. With no funds and rent and fuel bills mounting up, it's obvious that that is a system that is going to harm people. The inbuilt six-week wait before people receive any money through universal credit is excessive and must be reformed with immediate effect. A newly, totally, a new, a newly elected Tory councillor in Glasgow's East End said he joined the party because he wanted to support a party that believed that if you worked hard and played by the rules that you would get on in life. But the reality for many of his new constituents is that they do work hard and they do play by the rules, but that is not enough to stop them needing to rely on a food bank to feed themselves and their families. Recently, we've heard about nurses and veterans who are having to visit food banks. And when asked about this this week, Ruth Davidson repeated Theresa May's response that the reason for food bank use were complex. Well, the reason for food banks are because People are hungry 
and they can't afford food. There is nothing complex about it. It was here in this parliament at reception I learned about Vicky and Roger. The couple who have four children had a modest, comfortable living before being hit by the recession. They worked hard, paid their taxes, played by the rules. After losing his job in the insurance industry, Roger took a job on a zero hours contract. He worked as a slater, work dried up. His dwindling hours went to nothing. It was a very quick decline. They had never claimed benefits before in their lives, and soon it was difficult to feed all of their family every day. If it wasn't for the concern of a housing officer who noticed the couple had lost an alarming amount of weight, knowing there was something wrong, told Vicky and Roger about the food bank. They said that their referral, when Vicky and Roger were, were referred to the food bank, they said that more than anything, they were grateful for the kindness that was shown to them and not just the food. So food banks are much more than that. And that was my experience when I had the opportunity to attend a food bank in Cardonald in Glasgow. I had my eyes opened to a world that I did not fully appreciate existed. That there were people in Scotland starving, hungry, because of benefit sanctions, of low pay and of debt they couldn't get out of. I saw that food banks are more than just a place to receive needed food. They give out financial advice. They teach people how to survive on a very low budget. We have to plan a country without food banks. I cannot accept and will not accept that they should become a permanent feature on the high street. Food poverty is real, but it is unacceptable in the 21st century. And to eradicate it, we need to work as a parliament to tackle zero hours contracts, deal with low pay, and oppose the obvious and failing Tory policy of austerity. Thank you very much. Move to the open speeches of up to four minutes, please. I have Stuart McMillan followed by Adam Tompkins. Um, thank you very much, Presiding officer. Presiding officer, I want to first of all commend Pauline McNeill for securing this, uh, this members' debate. Unfortunately, the need for food banks hasn't decreased, but is in fact on the increase in Scotland. This Parliament has debated food banks before. I held a members' debate on the 6th of February 2014, and there has been committee reports and also other motions and questions surrounding food banks. Unfortunately, no matter the policy actions that have taken place, the numbers of people going to food banks has not decreased. They sadly have increased. Now, some would say that the policy decisions haven't worked. Now, I would argue that trying to do a job with one hand tied behind its back is always going to make policy decisions here at the mercy of the UK government ideological driven agenda. Now, I stress that my argument at this point is not a constitutional point. It's just a, a fact of the matter that some powers are reserved and they have an impact upon our fellow citizens here in Scotland. And furthermore, uh, despite the narrative that more people are in work and both governments claiming to have played a part in successful employment numbers, then clearly other factors are at play when we still have reported over 100,000 people going to food banks. There are some in society who have an opinion that those who attend food banks are work shy, scroungers and chancers. And I'm sorry to say, signing officer, but these sometimes are the views of some of our fellow citizens here in Scotland. These views are not mine and I don't recognise them. And if people want to believe some of the absolute garbage that's written in some of the media publications demonising our fellow citizens, then we as a society have yet another problem to address. And for a parent to go to a food bank to obtain food to either feed themselves or their family must be demoralising, it must be depressing and also difficult. And for others to then mock those seeking assistance is nothing short of a disgrace and a total complete lack of compassion for others. There are plenty of people in Scotland who are wealthy and comfortable, and I don't begrudge them that at all. In fact, I'm sure we would all want every single citizen to live that way. But nonetheless, presiding officer, life isn't fair, and some people, through no fault of their own, may find themselves going to a food bank. What then? What does society do to assist? Thank goodness for food banks and the volunteers and people who help. What, but what a sad, sad state of affairs that food banks exist in growing numbers, now reaching 52 in Scotland. Now, what a sad state of affairs when armed forces veterans are relying upon food banks for their food. 
What kind of society allows people who have fought for their country to be forced to go to food banks to eat? The updated figures for Inverclyde were startling. Ian Essen, the food bank manager from, Inver from Inverclyde's food bank, said, it is deeply concerning that we are seeing an increase of 15% in the number of three-day emergency food supplies provided to local people in crisis in Inverclyde over the last year. That is 3,574 three-day emergency food supplies to local people in crisis during 2016-17. This in comparison to 3,107 in 2015-16. Now, of this number, signing officer, 935 went to children in 2016-17, as compared to 730 in 2015-16. Over 38 tonnes of food has been generously donated by local people, churches, charities and businesses. That is an impressive amount and highlights the generosity of the Inverclyde community. However, presenting officer, it shouldn't have to be that way. There are two points I want to finish upon. Firstly, anybody who, who actually anybody could find themselves in need uh, of the food bank. Everyone's life circumstances can change and the food bank may be the last resort. And secondly, and this was provided by Oxfam in preparation for my members' debate in February 2014. This is, what this is what Oxfam stated. No one turns up at food banks because there is an opportunity for free food. They are driven there in sheer desperation. So for those who think a food bank is a substitute for benefits, for those who think people who attend a food bank are scroungers, work shy and chancers, and for those who think a food bank is a place to go to top up the food cupboard. Shame on you. Shame on you for attempting to, to degrade and demean our fellow Scots. Shame on you for failing the 935 children in Inverclyde and the thousands more across Scotland and the UK by your narrow, self-obsessed view of the world. And shame on those whose actions force people to go to food banks. And shame on those who perpetuate the lies about those who need to go to a food bank. The battle against poverty and hunger is, a is not just a domestic problem, but it's also a worldwide problem. And also the further £12 billion of welfare reform cuts will not help, but will only exacerbate a depressing situation that is gathering a pace. Thank you. I have Adam Tompkins to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking the Trussell Trust and other providers of emergency food aid in Scotland, the volunteers who staff food banks, the donors who generously give to food banks and the churches and other organisations that make their facilities available uh, to food banks. I'd also like personally to thank Ewan Gurr, who's in the uh, gallery this evening, uh, and colleagues of his at the Trussell Trust for their time and their patience in helping me uh, to understand the complexities of uh, food bank usage and for facilitating the visit that Pauline McNeill referred to um, in her remarks uh, to the South West Glasgow Food Bank in uh, Card Cardonald a few weeks ago. And one of the things that we learnt uh, on that visit was that most people who use a food bank in Scotland do so because of an acute shortage of money. There is no food poverty in Scotland, that's to say there's no shortage of food, but there is poverty in Scotland. Um, and uh, Ewan Gurr and his uh, colleagues uh, at the Trussell Trust have explained that most people who use food banks in Scotland uh, do so uh, do not rely on them for prolonged periods of time because of chronic or ongoing inability to pay for food, but because of an acute short-term or even one-off uh, crisis. Now, the most recent figures uh, published just last month show that food bank use in Scotland is patchy rather than uniform. In some local authorities, food bank usage has grown markedly, and that's of concern uh, to all of us. But in others, it has diminished even more strikingly. It's down 26% in Aberdeen and East Ayrshire. It's down 29% in North Lanarkshire. And food bank usage is down 39% in North Ayrshire. So what these figures reveal, it seems to me, is hard to discern. Uh, why food bank usage should be in decline in North Lanarkshire but on the increase in South Lanarkshire is not immediately obvious, for example. But what these figures should warn us of, I think, uh, is that simplistic explanations as to why food banks are used in Scotland are unlikely to be either useful or accurate. Yes, of course, people are using food banks because they're short of money. Uh, and, well, uh, can I just make progress on this point? Of course, people are using food banks because they're short of money uh, and short of food. But the reasons why people are short of money and short of food are not straightforward and are complex. I'll give away. Stuart McMillan. I thank Adam Tompkins for taking the intervention. Surely Mr Tompkins will agree with me. Uh, 
it's irrespective as to whether there is an increase or decrease going on across aspects and areas of Scotland. The fact we're actually having the discussion about food banks, the fact we're actually having this debate about food banks is the abhorrence that they, they really should not exist in this day and age and with the wealth that Scotland and the UK actually has. Adam Tom, well, well, you know, we, 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 we all share that view, uh, and the argument, I think, is an argument that's a very real argument and a very live argument, and one that I think we need to have more of and not less of in this Parliament about what we propose to do about it, because I think there are different views uh, a, a, about that. Can I offer a few remarks about what, on these benches, we think we should do uh, to tackle poverty? Um, and let me start with two remarks from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation uh, published in their important report, breakthrough report in September 2016. First, for those who can, work represents the best route out of poverty. And secondly, that increasing the value of social security benefits without addressing the underlying causes of poverty has failed to address poverty. Not my words, but those of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. And that's why Conservative governments have sought to lift people out of poverty by reforming welfare so that work always pays, by raising the national living wage, and by lifting our lowest paid workers out of income tax altogether. But I agree, more needs to be done. We do need, in Scotland, an open, honest conversation about how we address the underlying causes. Mr under Thompson's just coming to the end. About okay. uh, how we address the underlying causes of poverty. We know what these include. They include addiction, family breakdown, unemployment, educational underattainment. So my plea would be this. Only when we have a social justice policy that is focused on addressing these underlying causes, presiding officer, will we see food bank usage diminish across the whole of our country and not only in some local authorities in Scotland, as is already happening, but across the whole uh, nation. And in the meantime, and I close on this uh, point, the closing words of Pauline McNeill's motion are surely correct. Our social security system needs to work with voluntary organisations, such as the Trussell Tr Trust, and not pull against them. Joint, public and voluntary working should be encouraged, not frowned upon. A few years ago, we had a Prime Minister who talked passionately about this. He called it the big society, and he was right. Thank you. Neil Finlay to be followed by Mary Evans. Uh, thanks, President Officer. And I can I thank Polly McNeill for uh, bringing this uh, debate forward. We're all um, used to talking about hunger being a developing world issue, and of course it very much still is. But in Scotland, across the UK and the developed world, in 2017 we see hunger on the increase. Uh, malnutrition and diseases associated with a lack of food or poor diet, diseases like rickets, are on the increase. It's a tragic irony that at a time when food technology and food production is at its most sophisticated and advanced, more and more people are going hungry. But conversely, at the same time, obesity, historically a status symbol of wealth, is now a condition of poverty and inequality. In almost every area of Scotland, food banks are providing emergency food to people in immediate need. Some provided with so-called kettle packs of dried or packet products like instant soups and noodles made up by adding boiling water because the people can't afford or don't even have the means to heat food. What a damning indictment on our society, on our economy and our political system, the system that has created this situation. I'm sure that most of us in this parliament have donated to or held collections for their local food bank and felt, well, I've, I've done my little bit to help. But is that good enough? Is it enough to salve our conscience temporarily through a collection or donation, but then return to this place and pretend there's little or nothing we can do to address the root causes of why people are in such desperate need? Is it enough to say that poverty and inequality, the poverty and inequality that leaves our neighbours hungry is a bad thing, yet in the last year, when this place has effectively been a legislation-free zone, we have failed to take that opportunity to introduce any legislation to address something as fundamental as the need to feed our people. A country with rising levels of hunger does not, to me, suggest a country riding on a wave of progressive policy choices. Of course, Mr Tompkins' party and the policies that he supports have much to blame. And I notice that he focused his uh, what to do list on individual behaviours, not the structural 
issues within the economy and society. Some things never change. But I've said repeatedly that addressing poverty and inequality, including food insecurity and hunger, should be what drives this and any other government. The First Minister, whoever he or she may be, should be judged against how, successfully or not, they address these issues. We need a cross-government approach where the Minister for Fishing or Culture or the Environment has responsibility for dealing with poverty and inequality just as much as the Minister for Health or Social Security or the Economy does. And let me suggest some key policy areas to address the root causes of hunger, low, uh, which are low pay, underemployment, unemployment and in inadequate social security for those in need. Because I think we should make full employment the key objective of economic policy, creating sustainable jobs for our people. We should implement a real and genuine living wage of £10 an hour and end the insecurity of zero hours contracts bogus self-employment and precarious work. Use the powers of this parliament to make public procurement deliver key economic objectives, including fair work and fair pay. It is one of the most glaring missed opportunities of my time in this parliament that public procurement has failed. We should develop a social security system that helps and supports people back to work, and we have the opportunity with those new powers. We should re-democratise and free up local government Local government is the front line against poverty and inequality, and we should be redirecting hard cash to areas of most need, extending free school meal provision and breakfast clubs, and investing in early education, mental health support, and targeted support for, for vulnerable families, using every lever of government to include, increase trade union representation and membership, because an organised workforce is a healthier, wealthier, and safer one. And we should develop seamless partnership working to signpost people who present at food banks to statutory and non-statutory agencies who can help. And we should follow what is happening in France. My father-in-law lives in France and he works at a food bank twice a week. Uh, they have legislated to end the dumping of food waste and we should look at that as well. And most importantly of all of this, we need a redistributive tax policy that directs money into areas of most need. President officer, I'm just finishing now. This topic deserves much, much more time than a member's debate. We have had 20 or so debates on every aspect of Brexit. I wish we had 20 debates to discuss issues like this. Uh, before I move on to Ms Evans, there are a number of members who, who do wish to contribute, so I'm very happy to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 that we extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. Would Polly McNeill care to move? Thank you, Ms McNeill. So I move that under uh, this, sorry, I move that under this rule the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Has everyone agreed? Well, that's good. Okay, can I ask um, other speakers uh, to please try and keep to the four minutes? And I call Mary Evans to be followed by Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I really just want to start by thanking Pauline McNeill for bringing this motion forward to be debated in the Chamber because I would absolutely agree with Neil Finlay's uh, last point there. Um, the situation that was outlined highlights the crisis we face in this country and it's something that we need to talk about and something that we need to keep talking about so that people are aware of exactly how big this issue is and what's causing it and what we can do about it. Now, the fact that food banks even exist in this country in this day and age is a scandal. And sadly, they have become a fixed and necessary feature in many of our communities. We've already heard outlined the usage figures nationally and the dramatic and quite frankly shocking rise in food bank use over the course of the past few years. We see the figures of those living in poverty increase. More than 260,000 children are classed as living in poverty. That's one child in every four, and an increase of 40,000 from the previous year's figures from 2014 and 2015. Those figures were from the Child Poverty Action Group. And when Adam Tompkins was reeling off his list of causes of poverty and why, the reasons why people use food banks, one of the main reasons that they cited and one that he failed to mention was the social, social security system and, and uh, inadequate benefits that people receive. 
Now, what's responsible for that? We heard some of it already, low wages, underemployment, and as I've just said, a social security system which has been so utterly ravaged, it's no longer the safety net it was designed to be, uh, and instead humiliates and uh, demonises the people that it's supposed to help. Because let's take a look at exactly what's happened over the past years of the Tory government. We'll have the seriously flawed uni universal credit system which continues to shambolically roll, ramble on. The bedroom tax, the introduction of sanctions, cuts to employment support allowance, a freeze on working age benefits, a complete cut to housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds, the removal of the family element and child tax credits, cuts to bereavement benefits, leaving families tens of thousands of pounds worth off, worse off. 90% of people dependent on that benefit will be affected by the cut. The changes from disability living allowance and the transfer over to the personal independence payment or PIP, where 30% of those transferring to it receive no award at all and only 42% of new claimants get any sort of award. The changes to the state pension which have affected a whole generation of women and the now infamous two child cap on tax credits with its insidious rape clause estimated to affect 600,000 families across the UK. That's why we're in this situation. That's why so many people of our people live in poverty and why we are such an unequal and divided society. Yet we hear from the Sunday Times Rich List this week that we have more billionaires than ever living in the UK and I think it's, that's what makes it blindingly obvious where the Tories loyalties lie. Now in terms of what all of this boils down to in my own constituency, in one half of my constituency in Angus and figures published just this past week, emergency food supplies had to be provided to 2,771 adults and 824 children across the region. This is an all-time high and an increase of 917 people on the previous year. The Trussell Trust have stated that the biggest increases have been seen where universal credit has been rolled out, as Polly McNeill mentioned. And again, as she stated earlier, all of these are just Trussell Trust figures. It takes no account of the other charities and organisations who are also collecting and distributing food parcels, so the true picture is even worse. But in my hometown of Brechin, a new initiative has started to try and tackle this. Brechin Community Pantry is a newly established organisation which currently operates a food bank, delivering food parcels to those in crisis. However, it is also much more. I should also declare an interest at this point as a trustee of the group. They will soon be moving into new premises in the centre of the city, but rather than just having a standard food bank service, they will offer a whole range of services to the people that come in through the door. A clothing bank, debt counselling, a free food fridge, teaching basic cooking skills. Now, estimates from the Scottish Government suggest that as many as 500,000 individuals or families are not claiming the benefits they're entitled to. People need the support and information to access them. Rather than just dealing with the sharp end of the problem, it's about taking a holistic view to tackle the wider issues, giving people back their self-esteem and their confidence. Just to conclude, throughout this debate today, we've heard statistic after statistic about how bleak the picture actually is, but also how food banks are evolving to provide wider services, working in partnerships with others, and the positive effect that this can have. And it was great to actually meet the Scotland and Malawi partnership downstairs uh, to discuss the UN Sustainable Development Goals in Scotland. Could you and close, please, Ms. Evans? I, I will, thank you. Um, Ending poverty, ending hunger are some of those goals. We need to do what we can to fight against them, but that work is constantly undermined by the Tory government. And that people in Scotland have a very stark choice to make on the 8th of June, and that's what they need to bear in mind and all the points raised in this debate today. We seem to have very elastic four-minute slots this evening. We have Annie Wells to be followed by Monica Lennon, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate on tackling hunger in our society and supporting those who are most in need. Paula McNeill's motion specifically mentions the Trussell Trust, which this year turns 20, and I must commend those who volunteer week in, week out, and we are in no doubt that they are doing a great job. Organisations like the Trussell Trust provide a bridge between two very important groups, those in crisis who need food and donors who are moved to provide it. We know that poverty and hunger are caused by a variety of factors, often out with a person's control, including financial challenges, redundancy, debt, family breakdown, bereavement, addiction, homelessness, and mental and physical health problems. It is therefore important that we tackle the causes of poverty at their root so that the need for food bank use is minimized. In the words of Joseph Rowntree Foundation, 
additional spending on benefits without addressing the root causes of high housing costs, poor education and low pay has failed to reduce poverty. And the reasons, as Adam Tompkins has said, behind food bank use are complex and it is widely acknowledged that food bank use cannot be attributed to one single cause. And it's worth noting that food is becoming more expensive worldwide, with global food commodities costs increasing by an incredible 17% on average over last year's figures. And that food bank use has risen in many Western countries, including Germany and Canada. Scotland's food bank use must therefore be set in the context of wider global trends. Much is made of food bank use and the UK welfare regime, and I will admit that any large governmental system will never be perfect. However, I welcome the delivery of £90 billion a year of working age benefits and successful work to reduce delays in payments, especially hardship payments. The Trussell Trust recently commented that it was heartened by the Secretary of State Damien Green's willingness to engage with frontline charities. His department's work to pilot improvements and recent changes to universal credit taper rate, meaning people will keep more of their earnings. Food banks, food banks provide other free additional services as already been stated, and I welcome the Trussell Trust tremendous more than food initiative. Services such as money advice and budget cookery courses can help prevent people needing referral to food bank again and work to address the root causes of dependency on food banks. And it's also right that food bank volunteers are trained to signpost people to other agencies, services available to help resolve the underlying causes of the crisis. I was also encouraged to see Waitrose's funding of the Trussell's Trust Eat Well, Spend Less programme, providing advice on cookery, budgeting and nutrition. This action is key if we are to heed the Joseph Rowntree Foundation's advice on focus on prevention strategies. Scotland has a rich history of volunteering and I commend all who give up their time to help others in need. Food banks are a comfort in a crisis, albeit acting as a hub for advice and support. It is up to us in this parliament to address the underlying causes of food poverty to ensure that the people of Scotland do not need to rely on food banks. Thank you. I call Monica Lennon to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wouldn't go as far to say that I welcome tonight's debate. In fact, I find it heartbreaking that we're actually having this debate at all. But I would like to thank my colleague, Polly McNeil, for her motion this evening and for providing the opportunity for all of us to shine a light on these important matters. In a wealthy and prosperous country like Scotland, there's no reason, no reason that anyone should have to go hungry in 2017. Even the existence of food banks, let alone the scale at which they're currently being used in Scotland, is a national scandal. And we don't need to go on fact-finding missions or perhaps hide behind the, the complexities that Adam Tompkins is trying to, to describe, which I think is just covered for his government's policies. We know that the handful of policies and benefit sanctions imposed by the Tories in the UK government is hurting communities up and down the country. It isn't rocket science. But food bank volunteers and all those who donate to food banks are a credit to our communities. It's a damning verdict on the harmful impact of austerity politics and the backwards policies of the Tory party that stagnating wages, insecure work and cuts to welfare are forcing people into poverty. And as referenced in Polly McNeill's motion, the Trussell Trust estimate that almost 100,000 people used its food banks in the last year. 100,000 people. And that's before we even take into account other charities and community-based food banks which are helping those in need. The situation is quite simply a disgrace. Sitting here through the debate, I've been thinking about the food banks and the community groups in, in the region that I represent in central Scotland. Um, a few months ago, I went to visit Loaves and Fishes Food Bank in East Kilbride in South Lanarkshire, where I sat down with, with Dennis Curran, who will be known to many in the chamber, and he's appeared at, at committee here. Dennis is a man in his 70s. His wife, Cathy, is a seriously ill lady, yet seven days a week, they've been opening at a unit in a, a, a 
Business Park in East Kilbride, where people come and queue. 400 people in East Kilbride queued outside their door for food parcels at Christmas time. That is no fun. That is not taking the easy road out. Many of those people had to walk for miles because they're embarrassed and they don't want to go to the nearest food bank. Some walked from Rutherglen. Some walked uh, despite serious physical health problems and mental health problems. So yes, sometimes people are coming with a myriad of different issues, but it's not complex, uh, Adam Tompkins. Also, um, um, a frequent visitor to Hill House Community Food Co-op, which is just along the road from where I live. Now, that again is aimed at tackling food poverty across Hill House and Hamilton, and they offer fresh produce at low prices because people don't want handouts, people don't want to walk away with a food parcel. So even if they can spend a few pounds, they feel like, you know, they're not taken from society. But the humiliation that people go through to even just go in the door, um, it really is heartbreaking. And it's no secret to people in the chamber that I've been uh, raising the issue of period poverty. Women and girls having to go to food banks and ask for sanitary products to deal with a, a basic uh, need like menstruation. The I, Daniel Blake film, and I would encourage my colleagues on the Tory benches that haven't seen it to go and watch it because people think these are lifestyle decisions and people make it up to, you know, sensationalise it for the big screen. Ewan Gar is in the, in the gallery. You know, Ewan has shared some heartbreaking stories with me and I would urge everyone to, to get behind that. People who I speak to who say people go into a food bank and they're making choices like taking a bottle of washing up liquid because they know they can use that not only to wash their dishes, but for personal hygiene reasons as well. What a disgrace, what a disgrace for each and every one of us that our constituents are having to wash their bodies and their hair with washing up liquids. Um, I know that time is up and, and I've had my say, so um, we do need to use every power available in this parliament and elsewhere to really end this scandal. Thank you. I have Emma Harper to be followed by Patrick Harvey, who will be the last speaker in the debate. Thank you, presiding officer. I don't know if I'm pleased to be contributing this evening, um, but I would like to commend Pauline McNeill for securing this debate, um, titled Food Banks in Scotland's Hunger Crisis. I do agree with Monica Lennon that it is heartbreaking that such a debate is necessary in the 21st century Scotland. And I would like to point out that Scotland's only Tory MP doesn't seem too concerned. He told the assembled folk at a hustings last year when I contested the Dumfrieshire, Clydesdale and Tweeddale against him that food banks are in every European city, as if that was a justification for their existence for food banks. And then when sitting before our own Welfare Reform Committee, he dismissed evidence from charity workers and academics supporting the view that the use of food banks is a direct result of his government's welfare reform policies. He slated the evidence-based information that Mark Franklin was given. He's a volunteer in a food bank uh, first base in Dumfries. And he slated Mark's information because, and I quote, he voted yes. Mr Franklin's hard work and commitment to keep the doors of a first base food bank open has ensured that hundreds of Mr Mundell's own constituents are at least fed when the cruel benefit sanctions of his Tory government are imposed on them. The UK government line has for some time been that it is not poverty that makes people visit food banks, but the fact that food banks exist. David Cameron hailed food banks as a merely a happy example of the big society in action. I spoke again with Mark Franklin today, and he remains on the front line of austerity Britain. He cited the shocking rise of mental health problems he sees in those that are referred to him. He says that folk with already diagnosed mental health problems are deteriorating really quickly. These people with already prior diagnosed mental health issues, they're assessed as being fit to work when they're far from it. Just two days ago, Mark delivered a food package to a 60-year-old lady. I'll call her Mary, but it's not her real name. Mary is infirm and unable to carry anything because she has arthritis. Mary's GP had effectively, sternly ordered her 
to contact Mark for emergency supplies. She was living on five packets of noodles a week and ashamed to seek help from her doctor or even go to the food bank. Malnutrition is one of her diagnosed conditions now. And this lady, who has been a social worker for 20 years, helping people in the very same position that she now finds herself. So when in work, Mary earned about £500 a week. And before failing her employment support allowance test, now that she's been sanctioned, she receives £50 a week from the DWP. Was this what David Cameron had in mind when he attempted to justify £12 billion of benefit cuts as essential to stop in the merry-go-round of benefits dependency? I agree with Mark's sentiment that this system is crucifying people. Prior to 2010, when the Conservatives began their assault, there was a certainly there were cracks in the UK's welfare system. Unfortunately, those cracks have now become chasms. The first priority should and always will be the mental and physical health of those who find themselves unfortunate enough to become reliant on our disintegrating welfare system. But since the Tories are so desperate to justify this cruelty as a necessary evil in their supposed mission to cut the deficit, it is worth making the point that those wrongly assessed as fit to work simply fall upon the NHS and the justice system. And that's huge extent, expense. Austerity is actually costing the taxpayer a fortune. Meanwhile, the Scottish Government spends £100 million a year in an attempt to mitigate Tory cuts. In February, a new investment of £1.9 million was made available to local groups like food banks to ensure those working at the local level can deliver direct support to their communities. And I would urge local food banks to explore this funding stream. I hope we can agree across the Chamber today that limiting the damage knowingly inflicted by a Westminster Government on Scottish citizens is not the purpose of a devolved administration. Now call Patrick Harvey. Eat up your dinner. There's Wayne's in Africa that would be glad of that. Can I be the only member to whom those words were familiar week after week, evening after evening as a child? My granny's analysis of the causes of famine in African countries might have been a little simplistic, but the words were said out of empathy and out of her own understanding of the impact of hunger throughout her youth before, during and after the Second World War. By the time she died, she might have been forgiven, forgiven for thinking that no one would ever need to say, eat up your dinner, there's Wayne's in your school that would be glad of that. So I thank Pauline McNeill very warmly for bringing this motion. I want to say in response to those who cast food bank provision as a shining example of the big society in action, I want to say even in a healthy, functional food system and a fair and just economy, there is a place for voluntarism, absolutely. I've seen uh, food projects in Glasgow working with asylum seekers, sharing their skills, their food skills, many of which have been lost in our society, in our age, sharing their food skills with their new neighbours in their host communities. Everyone's better off as a result of that. And nothing is stigmatising about anyone participating in it. Sharing land, community projects that share land, bring people together, rich and poor, to experience growing food together, healthy for them to do it, healthy for them to eat it, and again, nothing divisive or stigmatising about that kind of voluntarism. And there are other cultures around the world in which the shared provision of food, the shared experience of eating together, again, rich and poor sitting down together to share the experience of eating together is a unifying experience. And anyone who's visited the Gurdwara in Glasgow will remember what I'm talking about uh, with the fantastic food that they share in a socially just and inclusive way. There is absolutely a space for that kind of voluntarism in a healthy, functional food system that doesn't have to be dominated and owned by a handful of multinational food giants. But it wouldn't need a simplistic brand name like the Big Society, because it's just a natural, instinctive expression of the human need to share. 
Adam Tompkins, um, the, the Conservatives seem a little confused as to whether food poverty exists. Adam Tompkins says it doesn't, Annie Wells says it does. But Adam asked a sensible question. Let's look at the differing impacts of food poverty, if we use that name or not. Let's look at the differing uptake of food bank provision and ask ourselves, why is it different in one place from another? But he didn't offer any answers. He asked a sensible question. Here's one sensible answer. The Trussell Trust says that 65% of food banks say that the six-week-plus wait for first access to universal credit has led to more people needing help. And in the areas where we've seen full universal credit roll out already, 16.5% average increase in referrals for emergency food compared to a much lower national average. That national average is still more than 6% increase. It still shames all of our society, but it's in the areas where we've seen failed UK government welfare reforms rolled out to their fullest extent, that we see the biggest increase. So how about analysing that answer? Now, of course, there are things that we can do with our existing powers in this parliament. We should be reducing the cost of the school day. We should be reducing the cost of public transport, and we could. We should be addressing, uh, as we heard earlier from Monica Lennon, the issue of period poverty. There's a great deal that we can do, and with the new welfare powers that we should. But underlying it all, Underlying it all, Deputy Presiding Officer, is a failed austerity programme from a UK government, a needless and unnecessary austerity agenda, which is quite consciously transferring wealth from the poorest third of our society to the richest third of our society and making this problem worse. Adam Tompkins says that work is the best route out of poverty. Well, sometimes, yes, well-paid, secure work which is healthy for people to undertake, can be a route out of poverty. But even their fake living wage is still a poverty wage. And not all workers will even receive that. He cites the, uh, consequence, the causes of, of poverty, but he lists only their consequences. The causes are structural, Deputy Presiding Officer. A failure to distribute wealth fairly in our society, a failure to recognise that the wealth of our economy belongs to all of us instead of to a tiny number of people labelled wealth creators. And until we overturn that fundamental error, we'll continue to be putting sticking plasters on this grievous wound. I now call Jean Freeman to respond to this debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to respond on behalf of the Scottish Government and, like members before me, I, I want to thank Pauline McNeill for bringing this matter to the Chamber and I also want to thank uh, other colleagues who have made their contributions. I share the majority view in this Chamber that in 21st century Scotland, a country rich in both resources and human talent, it is shameful that there remains a pressing need for us to tackle food poverty with people who can't afford to feed themselves or their families. In the seven years since the Tories entered Downing Street, the number of people needing food banks has grown exponentially. Now, we've heard that the factors behind that are complex. For me, the reasons are pretty straightforward and they lie at the Tories' door. Low wages, benefit cuts, benefit sanctions and benefits delays. The numbers referred because of low income rising to 25% and 42% of all referrals as a result of benefit cuts and delays. So let's be clear, food poverty is a visible sign of the wider poverty we are seeing as a result of seven years of Tory austerity and welfare cuts. The freeze on working benefits, six weeks universal credit delay, which others have referred to, the two tariff policy now introduced with its abhorrent rape clause, which will cost families between two and a half and 7,000 pounds a year, the benefit cap, affecting at least 5,000 people in Scotland. The list is much longer, but all of it adds up to pushing more and more people into crisis. A state of affairs that the majority of us in this chamber find shameful, but yet again, one that apologists in the Scottish Tories continue to ignore, to dodge around and to be silent on. It is because of their UK government's failed ideology that heaps more and more misery on those least able to withstand it, those in work and those seeking work, 
the vulnerable, the disabled, the elderly and children. I am looking at a graph from the Institute of Fiscal Studies that tells me that in the five years between May 2010 and May 25, 2015, the poorest in our society lost 4% of their income in those five years. And it tells me that what's to come that we know of so far since May 2015, the long run impact of tax and benefit reforms will see that poorest group lose 10%. So let no one say that the underlying causes here are not the agenda of this Conservative government, an ideology as fundamentally flawed in its conception as it is a failure in meeting its stated aim. Last week, or the week before in this chamber, when we debated the two-child policy, we were told that it was part of the sound management of public finances. That will be the sound management that sees the national debt now over 1.7 trillion and rising by the minute. Sound management of the national finances on the backs of the poor, the vulnerable, those in work and those least able and those least responsible for creating that debt in the first place and sound management which is fundamentally flawed in delivering what it says it's out to do. This government will continue to oppose the policies of the Tory government at UK level and we will continue to do all we can within our resources and our powers to help protect people from the worst excesses of Tory policies. And that includes exposing the human impact, as other members have done tonight, of their policies in their actions. Now, in the run-up to June the 8th, and for as long as they have power to damage the lives of people who live and work in Scotland. The 50 concrete actions of the Fairer Scotland Action Plan have as central to our commitment the capacity to work with people to reduce and ultimately end poverty in all its forms, be that child poverty, food poverty, fuel poverty, or indeed period poverty. And we are clear that in delivering this, dignity has to be at the heart of what we do. On the specific matter of food poverty, the recommendations made to the Scottish Government by the Independent Short Life Working Group a group of experts strongly influenced by people with lived experience of food poverty was very clear that collectively we should focus on reducing and removing the need for food banks. So we need to focus our efforts on models that increase income and develop community food initiatives, some of which Patrick Harvey has referred to. That is exactly what we're doing in our promotion of the living wage. Yes, of course. Neil Finlay. She would address issues of deliberate and concerted redistribution of money from those who can afford it into the pockets of those who need it. Jean Freeman. I thank Mr Finlay for his intervention. I'm actually about to agree with him later on, so I hope he's sitting ready for that. I do think it is important that our resources of a country are fairly distributed, but I also think that in doing that, we need to make sure that those on low and middle incomes are not penalised. So Mr Finlay and I at this point will continue to disagree on this government's income tax policies. And I'm sure we'll have more debates on that in the years to come. But the work that we are doing in investing, and in, no, I need to get on, in advice services, in promoting the living wage, and in our one million pound a year fair food fund, all adopt the dignity principles recommended by that independent group. We're determined to see a change and we accept the independence group's recommendations to focus on maximising income and shifting from charitable food bank models to supporting community-based food initiatives. What matters is that everyone can access affordable, nutritious food in ways that are dignified and just. It is a basic human right. It's what the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights meant when it specified adequate food as one of the factors that make up the right to an adequate standard of living. A covenant the UK ratified in 1976, but one that this Tory government chooses to ignore. So we are looking at what enshrining the right to food in Scots law might look like and whether it could support us to tackle the very real problem of hunger with a response based on human rights and dignity for all. We are firm in our 
aim to eradicate the need for emergency food provision from Scotland. And we're in no doubt that this government is serious about eliminating food insecurity, as we are serious about tackling the underlying causes of poverty within the powers at our disposal. And Neil Finlay is right when he says that tackling poverty is a responsibility of every part of this government. And it is one that we are working to take seriously across all the portfolios that this government is responsible for. But you know, Patrick Harvey is also right that there are actions that we can take in this parliament, in this government, with the powers that we have. But the fundamental underlying problems are problems that come from a Tory government with an agenda that cares little, despite the warm words, despite the apologies, despite the attempt to divert our attentions elsewhere, a Tory government that cares little about the impact it has on the majority of people in this country. Mr Tompkins asked us to focus on what we should do. I would ask him to start his focus by standing up to his Tory colleagues at UK level. This meeting is closed.